So now we are ready to discuss the fifth and final rule of whole logic, which is uh, which is the while construct. Recall that we have been discussing all the different rules, uh, verification rule conditions that should be generated for different imperative language constructs like if then else, assignment, sequence. We also discussed one uh, consequence rule that basically helps us generalize to a larger set of uh, precondition, postcondition pairs or more specifically whole triple uh, pairs, uh, triples, whole triples, which basically represent partial correctness conditions. So here's the, here's the fifth rule, which uh, is again uh, says, you know, when can I have a partial correctness condition across a loop? And so the partial correctness condition is again represented as a whole triple. So it says that across a loop, which is of the form while B C, where B is the Boolean condition and C is some body of the while loop, then uh, you, this whole triple hold, which is P, this whole program and P and not B holds. If P, if this holds, which is the, uh, which is written above the, this in, uh, on the top uh, of the line in this inference rule. Now recall that we have been discussing how we can construct uh, whole triples constructively. And so this is the only rule that we have. Uh, and this is, the, this is the first rule and the only rule that we'll have for uh, constructing a whole triple across a loop, a while loop in this, uh, in this case. I'm specifically considering a while loop because it generally covers all different kinds of loops. Of course, there are other kinds of loops that can be formed through go-to statements and other things. We are not really discussing that, those kind of syntaxes. We have used a very simple imperative language which supports if, then, else, and while. And you know, we, we have one could generalize it to a larger language as well. Basic concepts remain the same. So this is the first, uh, you know, first rule that actually allows us to construct a whole triple across a while construct. And the, the condition for that is that this whole triple can be constructed if this whole triple is available through the other four rules that we have, or maybe including this rule. If I'm able to construct this whole triple, then this whole triple will also hold. And that's the constructive way of defining what whole triples hold. So let's look at this, uh, this antecedent, which is the stuff above the line. So it says P, if P and B, C, P holds, which means if P and B is true before C, and then you execute C, then P holds, then this whole thing holds, which is if P is true, then you execute the loop, the loop continues. It can, if it does not terminate, then you know I can put anything here, but recall this is a partial correctness condition. So if whenever the loop terminates, then uh, this will also hold. So if, if this whole, if this whole triple holds, then this triple, whole triple also holds. All right. So what, what is the, you know, what is the intuition behind it? Why, why do we have this inference rule? Well, you, you can see that, you know, P is something that holds at the beginning of the loop. P is also something that holds at the end of the loop. And there's additionally one more thing that holds at the end of the loop, uh, which is not B because, you know, we know that we have exited the loop and the only reason you will exit this loop is when the Boolean condition evaluates to false. So P holds, through, uh, at the beginning of the loop and the end of the loop. What does this say? Uh, but, but this is also saying, so what does this say? It says, if P holds, if P and B hold at the beginning of one iteration of the loop, then P also holds at the end of that iteration. So if P and B hold at the beginning of an iteration, then P holds at the end of the iteration. In other words, notice that when I'm the beginning of the iteration, which is at this point, then B anyway holds because, you know, I just checked B. And so if I have reached here, I've decided to continue in the loop. So B anyways holds and P here basically hold and, you know, assuming P and B hold, then after one iteration, P holds again. So in other words, P can be thought of as a loop invariant. P is a loop invariant at the beginning of the loop body. All right. And if so, basically it's saying that if P is a loop invariant and you can for the body of the loop, then if P holds the beginning of the loop, then P also holds at the end of the loop. And that's not very hard to see because P holds at after every iteration of the loop. And so whenever the loop exits, then also P holds. Additionally, we have these uh, an extra kind of post condition which says not B. That's because you know, the only reason we exit the loop is when B is false. 
Moreover, when we actually uh, try to prove that P is a loop invariant, we have an extra uh, extra condition that is available to us, which is that B holds at the beginning of uh, the loop iteration because the loop we have we reached the beginning of the loop iteration only because the check evaluated the check B evaluated to true. All right, so let's look at an example of the application of this rule. And so here is an example of a while pro loop program that we have seen earlier. It says while x is not equal to zero, x is x minus one, x gets x minus one. And the whole triple that we are interested in proving is that if initially x is a non-negative number, which is x is greater than or equal to zero, then at the end of the program, x equals zero. So pretty simple program, pretty simple property just basically saying that just it just counts down x all the way to zero and we need to prove this whole triple and recall once again that the only rule that we uh, the only ru uh, inference rule that we can apply across a rule uh, across a while loop is basically this fifth inference rule for the while loop and so i'm going to apply this try and apply this rule so when i pattern match this program with this then um, you know maybe i can say p is x is greater than or equal to zero and uh, you know, b is x is not equal to zero and p and not b would become x is greater than or equal to zero and not of x is not equal to zero becomes x equals zero. So x is greater than or equal to zero and x equals zero just becomes x equals zero. So actually it pattern matches nicely. So um, yeah, here is the slide which shows this, which is that if I consider x is greater than or equal to zero as p, then uh, Q is nothing but Q can be actually Q is just equivalent to P and not B because X equals zero is the same as saying P, which is X is greater than or equal to zero and not B, which is X equals zero. So, so this pattern matches nicely. And so I will be able to prove this if I'm able to prove this, right? So if I'm able to construct this for the body of the loop. So what does, what does this evaluate to based on this pattern matching for P and B? Well, I'm going to say if X is greater than or equal to zero, then if I execute x is colon equal to x minus one, then uh, x is still greater than or equal to zero. But that's not really true because if x is greater than or equal to zero, x could have been zero and then I decrement it, then x can actually become negative. So here is what it will turn out to be. It's p and b. So here the and b actually helps us. Notice that b is basically x is not equal to zero. So this becomes x is not equal to zero. I've written greater than, but more precise thing would have been x is not equal to zero and say if p and b hold then you execute one iteration one loop iteration which just executes x equals x minus one then p holds so is it possible is it is this whole triple true well let's see if x is greater than or equal to zero and x is not equal to zero then x is strictly greater than zero and then i decrement it by one so at most it will be either still strictly greater than zero or it will be equal to zero and so indeed this whole triple holds and because this whole triple holds we can apply the while rule to show that this whole triple also holds now that was an example where it was really easy i mean whatever was the actual original problem that was given to us which was i had to show that you know this was p and this was uh, this became p and not b and you know it matched really nicely and i was able to find the loop invariant just by this pattern matching in this particular example but now I'm going to show you an example where just this pattern matching does not work. Uh, and that's why, you know, loop finding loop invariant is a hard problem. And that's uh, one of the most, uh, you know, that's one of the most, that's one of the undecidable problems in program verification. So let's see. Here is a program which says while n is not equal to zero, sum equals sum plus n, n equals n minus one. So not only does it decrement n on every iteration, but it also accumulates into sum. And the whole, tri whole triple that I'm interested in proving is that if initially sum equals zero and n not and n equals some initial value n not and n not is greater than or equal to zero. So n not is non-negative. Then at the end of this program, the sum is going to be n not into n not plus one by two. This is the, this is the arithmetic uh, progression. Um, I mean, you can get this kind of mathematical formula from uh, the arithmetic progression if n naught is greater than or equal to zero then i'm just basically doing this doing n plus n minus one plus n minus two plus n minus three uh, all the way up till i reach zero and that's going to be n naught into n naught plus one by two now i want to prove this uh, this whole triple and i'm going to once again try and pattern match with the while rule and say okay uh, maybe this whole thing is p and may and maybe this whole thing is p and not b 
where b is basically n not equal to 0. So let's see if it pattern matches. So our first uh, thing is what is p and not b? So p and not b is basically this whole thing which is sum equals 0 and n equals n not and n not is greater than equal to 0. And what is not b? n not b is basically n equals 0. So p and not b just becomes this whole thing and if you just kind of see, look at this and simplify this, n equals 0 basically means n naught is also equal to 0 and sum is also equal to 0. So p and naught b is just sum equal, everything is 0, sum is 0, n naught is 0 and n is 0. And, and from there I can actually show that q actually holds which is p and naught b actually implies q because recall that q is sum equals n naught into n naught plus 1 by 2, that's what I need to prove. And so P and not B implies Q, which basically means, uh, you know, I can actually use my consequence rule and use P and not B as Q prime and then say, okay, because Q prime implies Q, uh, maybe I cannot prove, uh, you know, I can actually prove a stronger condition and maybe then, then pattern match. So instead of proving this, instead of proving this, I actually try to prove this whole thing here, which is sum equals zero, N equals zero, n not equals zero. Now, of course, this is not going to be true, and but you know, this is what the pattern matching at least gives us. And if I pattern match like this, then this is what I get at the end because that's what I want p and not b. Assuming I consider this whole thing as p, and then when I say this is p and not b, then yes, indeed, you know, uh, this p and not b pattern matches with q in the sense that I, I need to apply an extra consequence rule because this whole thing implies q and that you know that helps that is okay, that is acceptable from our consequence rule. But now the, the other thing I need to prove is this antecedent. So if I use this as P and this as B, then is my antecedent true, which is, is this P actually a loop invariant? Well, intuitively, this P is not a loop invariant because notice that P is basically some, also saying sum equals zero. So how can that be a loop invariant when actually I'm doing sum equals sum plus N? But let's just see that more, more formally. If I say P and B initially, and then I execute one body of the, uh, one iteration of the loop body, which is sum equals sum plus N, N equals N minus one, then this is B. So P and B, which is N is not equal to zero. Then can I prove that P still holds, which is sum is still equal to zero? The answer is no, because notice that if sum is equal to zero and N is not equal to zero, then sum equals sum plus N will, likely be not equal to zero and so I cannot show that sum will be still equal to zero after one iteration of the loop. So in this example, I mean in my previous example I could simply pattern match whatever was the p with uh, with this in, in this rule and I could actually apply this rule because uh, this the antecedent was also coming out to be provable. But in this case the antecedent which is this thing is not coming out to be provable and so it's not okay to be, I cannot apply this rule. So what can I apply? How can I basically, you know, you still use this rule and still be able to prove uh, this whole triple, which is, which is, you know, P is this and Q is this, and this is my Y loop. So the answer to that is I need to find some loop invariant P prime, such that it is actually a loop invariant, which means P prime and B, if C, which is the loop body, P prime hold, which means if P prime and B is true at the beginning of the loop body and you execute one iteration of the loop body, then P prime holds at the end of the loop body. If I can show that, then, uh, and further I can show that P implies P prime. So I, I can, I'm using my consequence rule. So not only do I find a P prime that satisfies this condition, which is this coming from this antecedent, but I also use my consequence rule to say, okay, the P prime should also satisfy the fact that P implies P prime. Moreover, it should satisfy the fact that P prime and not B is kind of either implies Q, Q or uh, should imply Q. And once again, I'm using the consequence rule and I'm calling that Q prime, right? So, so basically I'm saying that I need to find some P prime such that this becomes P prime, this becomes P prime, this becomes P prime, this becomes P prime. And then whatever I intended to prove, it is such that if P primes this P prime and not B hold, then PCQ will also hold and that, that I'm going to apply the consequence rule because I'll have to prove that P implies P prime and P prime and not B implies Q where Q is this and P is this. All right. 
So can I find such a P prime? And that's the real question. And one, no, I'm going to uh, give you the answer. We cannot, uh, this problem of finding this P prime in general for any general program, of course, for this particular small program, we may be able to implement some tricks or uh, search procedures to identify what should be the P prime. But in general, for any program, identifying this P prime is an undecidable problem. So why is this problem so hard? Well, let's try to look at what would P prime be for this particular correctness condition that we are interested in proving. And the P prime that we require here is basically this uh, formula in green that I have written, which is sum equals n naught minus n into n naught minus n plus one by two and n is greater than or equal to zero. So this is the whole loop invariant that I can use, which is P prime. And if I use this as my P prime, you will be able to show that it is indeed a loop invariant, which means if P prime and B hold at the beginning of a loop body, then you execute a loop body, then P prime would still hold. It's not hard to see this because sum is increasing by n and n is decreasing by one. And notice that, you know, because sum increases by n and n decreases by one, uh, you know, they're going to actually cancel out each other and you're going to still get the same P prime at the end. So once you have P prime, the other, and you have been able to show that P prime is actually a loop invariant, which means you have shown that P prime and B C P prime hold, then you have to also show that P implies P prime and P prime and not B implies Q, right? I'm also writing P prime and not B as Q prime. And in other words, Q prime implies Q. All right. So, and that will also fall out because notice that P imply P is basically saying sum equals zero and N equals N naught is greater than or equal to zero. Now, because N equals N naught, n naught minus n will just become zero. And so this whole thing will become zero. Sum equals zero, so zero equals zero would be true. Uh, and n is greater than or equal to zero is also true because n naught is greater than or equal to zero and n equals. So P would imply P prime. That's my first point. And the second point is that P prime and not B would imply Q. So if I look at P prime and not B is basically saying that n equals zero. So when in n equals zero, sum becomes n naught minus zero that just n naught and this becomes n naught minus zero plus one. That's just n naught plus one divided by two and n is greater than equal to zero. n is equal to actually n will be equal to zero. So n is greater than equal to zero is also true. And so that this that that just becomes n, you know, P prime and not B uh, becomes will imply that sum equals n naught into n naught plus one by two. So yeah, once again, uh, when I when I say P, so the first part was that P implies P prime. We've already done that. This part is basically saying that this P prime and not B, which is n equals zero, implies Q, which is sum equals n naught into n naught plus one by two. You can check it for yourself. All right. So you can see by the example that I've shown previously that the P prime that was required was pretty complicated and it wasn't really possible to derive it either from the original P or from the program structure or anything like that or from Q or anything like that. And so finding the required P prime or Q prime is undecidable, but let's understand what is, what are some characteristics of the whole logic that I've described so far. And there are two ways to describe, uh, uh, to kind of characterize any logic. One is soundness. Soundness says that whether this logic only derives true facts. So that basically means it, no erroneous fact can be derived by whole logic. So whatever facts are being constructed out of the five inference rules, they actually all hold at runtime, which means whatever predicates you actually are generating using the constructive uh, proof rules that I've, uh, inference rules that I've shown uh, earlier, the five rules, those will actually hold at runtime for all possible executions of the program. That's soundness. And the other way to say that is that there cannot be any erroneous fact that is derived from these five rules. Completeness says that all true facts can be derived by whole logic. So for example, the example I showed, which is, you know, uh, at the end of the loop, sum equals n naught into n naught plus one by two. Now, can that be always derived by whole logic? Well, that's questionable because I mean, the whole logic is not telling us how to find the loop invariant, how to find the P prime. And so just the whole logic is not enough to derive all possible true facts. I mean, you know, it will only derive 
correct facts, that's soundness. Completeness says that all true facts can be derived by the whole, whole logic. That would have been great. It would have been ideal if you know all true facts could be derived by whole logic. But and you know we would have all we would have all our verification problems solved really easily. But that's actually not true. Whole logic in, alone is not enough to derive all possible true facts. It's not possible. I mean, there must be although some statements must be true. Just using whole logic, you cannot construct that statement straight away. You need more machinery to be able to construct that statement. What is that more machinery? It is basically that P prime, Q prime identification, which is the loop invariant in, uh, uh, identification, more informally speaking. So why why do I say that finding the loop invariant is undecidable? Well, that I'm falling back on the famous result, which is called the Godel theorem. Uh, if the first order logic includes arithmetic, which mostly all programs do involve, and here I'm talking about integer arithmetic, which you know integer can be infinite size and things, then there exists no complete axiomatization, axiomatization of the implication in the consequence rule. So you know, this is a slightly technical way of saying that it's not always possible to find the required p prime and also by consequence the q prime in the consequence rule because notice that when we try in, in you know when i try to solve the while program i basically try to find some p prime which was a loop invariant and then i applied the consequence rule so what is that p prime such that you know uh, i can basically prove that this whole triple holds how do I, is there an algorithm can i can there be an algorithm that always is able to find such a p prime Godel theorem proves, sh shows that there cannot be any such algorithm that can always find p prime for any arbitrary program, and so this is not always possible to find the required p prime, and so whole logic will always be incomplete. So we have a proof that it will always be incomplete. Well, although that is you know that is a little bit discouraging news. Here is you know here is another way to kind of uh, characterize the problem, which is called relative completeness, which says. All true facts can be derived by the whole logic. So now we are trying to show that whole logic can be complete, provided, so there are some riders, the first order assertion language is rich enough to express the loop invariant. So whatever is the first order language, by first order I mean the quantifiers are only on the values. So using that, uh, you know, for example, in our invariants we are saying for all sum, for all n naught, sum equals n naught into n naught plus one by two. So that is a loop invariant that is expressible in the first order assertion language because the first order assertion language includes quantifiers and it includes arithmetic operations and things like that so indeed the first order assertion language is rich enough to express the loop invariance and the first order theorems needed in the consequence rule are given example by an oracle so if somebody is able to give us what are the required loop invariants like p prime or q prime and things like that which basically are the uh, theorems needed in the consequence rule then if some oracle is giving us those uh, those loop invariants then the whole uh, uh, logic is actually complete so the what this relative completeness theorem is saying is that the only source of incompleteness in whole logic is that identification of p prime uh, and q prime in the consequence rule if some oracle if you know for any such case where you are interested in finding such a p prime and q prime an oracle was available and you just ask the oracle oh can you please tell me the p prime and it tells you the right p prime and then you are able to proceed with the proof then any um, true fact that you were interested in would be derivable from whole logic so that's a good thing that whole logic Com com almost complete except that there are these holes to be filled which are basically loop invariants and and this is an important uh, result which is relative completeness because that means that although whole logic is incomplete we exactly we know what is the exact nature of incompleteness and we then we can just work on uh, addressing that incompleteness so if we the more we address that incompleteness for example the more sophisticated algorithms we develop to identify the loop invariants the you know we'll be able to do more and more proofs and uh, as you know if, if we are able to find the most com bet the best possible invariant inference algorithm then we have also found uh, basically uh, found the best possible uh, uh, system to basically prove partial correctness